All right, we're going to continue on chapter 11. And, and again, I apologize, this is a super long chapter. Um, but depending on how they redo the AP test, uh, I can't afford right now to skip anything for you guys. Uh, hopefully we'll know some more in the next couple of weeks. Um, but we're going to start with what the imprint um, of agriculture looks like on the cultural landscape. You remember that cultural landscape is what we do, right? How we alter the landscape to reflect the things that are important to us. And obviously, uh, agriculture is incredibly important, right? Um, so agriculture has had a significant imprint on cultural landscape. Uh, the patterns in the land, right? How, what it looks like, how we mark land off, how we choose to set up the towns around uh, agriculture, uh, and the methods of survey systems that we're going to just barely touch on uh, all have an idea or have an impact on the cultural landscape. Um, we're going to look at survey systems just for a little bit. There's always some strange question on the AP test about survey systems. Uh, and so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, um, but I would encourage you to make sure that you're reading this chapter. Um, in the United States, we use what's called the rectangular survey system. Right? We adopted it after the American Revolution. Uh, and you can see on this picture, this is Oregon, right? You can see the, the different areas of the um, agri you know the agricultural land how it's divided up in like squares or rectangles right that reflects that rectangular survey system it's very much uniformity right it makes everything look somewhat the same and you can see it in the next one the areas where we use that rectangular system and it's mostly the yellow areas and these are lands that were pretty much gotten after the end of the American Revolution. Uh, the rest of the area, the different colors that you see show different types of survey systems and you're not going to have to know all those. But the different survey systems that were brought over um, by the different European countries uh, that came in and settled uh, in North America. Uh, the rectangular survey system is attached to the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act, you'll learn in U.S. history, was um, an attempt by the American government to get land particularly the, the Louisiana Purchase, right, settled by American settlers. Uh, we've talked about this before, but once you settle on the land, it's a lot harder to take it away from somebody, right? So we would give, um, let's say, 100, I think it was 140, 160 acres of land uh, to anybody that would just go and settle on it, right? You had to settle it and you had to improve it. What does that mean? You built a house and, and any kind of house would do. It didn't have to be anything particular. Right, do something to the land, and after a certain number of years, then that land was yours free of charge. Right, so you have different areas of survey systems that are, uh, again, used by different places around the world. So up here uh, in the area settled by England, right, you have a system that was pretty much used by England. Down here you've got more German, um, Dutch areas as well, and then some down here, the red areas, the long lot ones, are particularly French. And you can see that these are areas where the French settled. Uh, so New Orleans, up through Louisiana, uh, in the Mississippi, and then up here, my hometown, St. Louis, again, settled by the French. So you will have the French system as well. All right. Um, Let's also talk about how different towns look in areas around the world that, you, that are predominantly agricultural. Right? Um, in um, most areas where you see subsistence agriculture, you're going to see something like villages. Right? There, these are, agriculture is typically not done in strong urban areas. So in areas where you have a lot of subsistence agriculture, you're going to see a lot less urbanization and a lot more villages. Traditional farming villages where everybody's involved in farming are still pretty common uh, in areas like India, Sub-Saharan Africa, China, Southeast Asia. And in fact, in India, 60% of all uh, residential areas are farming villages, right? So typically, you're going to see areas in, in these villages where uh, it is set up to deal with the people who live there who, deal, who are dealing in farming, right? They're closely connected to the land. Um, the villages are set up to reflect the need to use all the, you know, of the land. Um, if you go to places like Japan, right, you will see 
uh, multi-story farms, a lot of aquaponics where they grow food in water, right? And those can be done in warehouses, not necessarily with using land. But when you don't have a lot of land, you got to make the most of it. Um, in the United States, and let's go back to uh, to Oregon, right? Um, you're going to see a very traditional American farm. Right? You have the village, the little residence here surrounded by farmland, right? If you've read any old stories about the Old West, people were very far from each other, right? The little houses were set in um, on the land and then they were very far apart from their neighbors, right? If we go to this particular village, we're now in France, it's an area called Aquitaine, uh, which hopefully in, you'll learn a, a lot about in either European history or world history. Uh, the area fought, area of France fought over by England and France all the time. All right, you see a very different setup here, right, because you see the village here, right, um, and then you have the farmland out here. So the farmers go into the village to sleep at night, right, and then they go out uh, during the day. Uh, notice down here in the foreground, you have a really nice house. Uh, probably that would be the, the, uh, king's man, the, the lord of the manor, right? And he would be set up high so he could look down upon his uh, holdings uh, and everyone, this was all land that was owned by him and then leased by or, you know, some kind of rental agreement uh, with the farmer to do the work. All right. Um, in, uh, this is called, what's called a nucleated <coughs> settlement, a nuclear right, like a nucleus, like you guys are familiar in biology. Houses are grouped together in tiny clusters in a small village or a hamlet. Uh, and so they are, the villages are grouped together, and, uh, probably in the more hillier areas. You can kind of see that this land maybe is a little hilly right here, and flat land is then saved for farming. Uh, again, the castle up here in the hill is for protection, right, it, the Lord of the Manor can see what's coming. Uh, you know, and be able to protect the people that work for him. All right, in our next slide, we're looking at several different types of villages. Again, this might be a question on the AP test. Um, there are different kinds of villages depending upon where they are, what the purpose is for, uh, and the type of land that they would have available, right? Um, in low-lying areas, of, particularly of Western Europe, you'll see uh, in A, uh, a type of linear village, right? They were often, um, like you saw in the, in the slide beforehand, right? There's a river, looks like maybe, that flows in through this area. I'm not really sure, right? But this is more of a linear type village where there's a road running through it. Um, so if there's some kind of levee or road that runs through it, people have their houses on uh, either side of the road. They have a small area, the kind of yellowish looking area is their garden that they grow for their own personal use and then uh, the farmland goes directly behind them. Uh, a village may look like what's called a cluster village and that's you see that in B, right, where there is no real reason to have, um, there's no like road or river running between them. Um, so you will again, dang it, I'm really trying to get rid of that. Um, you will see, you know, a variety of different roads uh, and then the village is clustered in a center uh, with the village with the road out behind. Uh, typically these villages will grow, start as a, a small hamlet at the intersection of two roads and then will develop uh, as they move out. Uh, C is a round village. Uh, sometimes you will see uh, these in European areas, but this is really, really common uh, in Eastern Africa uh, because you have, uh, again, the villages are is surrounding, it's in a round circle, small garden area and the land behind it, um, but you have predators, right, animals or potentially, you know, some people trying to steal your stuff. Uh, and so what would happen at night is they would bring the cattle into the center area and there would be a pen or some kind of gate system right around in this area so that they were protected at night uh, and that if something were to happen people could come out of their houses very quickly all right the last one walled villages again for protection you have a wall 
right? Gardens in the middle, some maybe this is a road or even maybe a little stream that comes between them for a water source. Uh, the farmers live inside, but agriculture is done outside, right? Mostly for protection. And then more and more you'll see this kind of grid village. Uh, grid villages are more modern, right? Planned, they're planned settlements. Everybody has their own little grid, right? And then they move out uh, to do their agriculture. Um, grid patterns are what you see commonly, but that's not a, a more recent development. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right, understand that half the world's population, right, if we're almost at 8 billion people, almost 4 billion people live in one of these types of settlements, right? A agricultural village is one of the most common settlements in the entire world. Uh, so half the people will live there. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right, this is a Cambodian um, houses, right? They are on a river. Right, there are a lot of rivers. Uh, it's a lot of rainy monsoon type uh, climates that you'll see in these areas. So typically the houses are built up on sticks to accommodate the rising waters. Uh, people don't go around on bikes and buses and cars. Uh, they use the river as their infrastructure. Right. Um, sometimes in some of these villages you can see where the wealthier people live or the people that have a higher uh, social status than others. They will have a different house, right? We do that a lot in, in our communities. You'll see, uh, you know, bigger houses, bigger land typically means that you're better off, right? Uh, size and quality of your house often represent where you live uh, or what status you have uh, within the community. Um, in agricultural villages, that's true too, right? Remember, you have to have a leadership class someone who helps direct the farming, who helps uh, store any kind of surplus and then distribute it at a later time. Um, the last slide we're going to look at, right, is a, uh, a house or a farm in uh, Minnesota. So we're back in the United States. Again, reflecting the one house and the farm and the farm buildings are near each other. Right? Not in any kind of cluster or linear village. You've got them fairly spread out. Um, and here you're seeing what your book is calling functional differentiation in buildings. Right? So you've got multiple different types of buildings that will store multiple different types of things. Right? So the, 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 you know, these tall cylindrical buildings over here may house different kinds of seed or grain. Uh, maybe there are liquid fertilizers or pesticides as well. Um, possibly that's the house, right? You have a barn, you probably have an area where you repair your, you know, farm equipment and what have you, right? Um, in a United States type barn and probably North American barn or more North American uh, home in a farm, you're going to have just as many buildings on this farm as you do in some of the hamlets that we just looked at in places like uh, Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. It's just a, a different way of doing things. Uh, everybody has their own. Uh, but in the United States, you're looking more and more like at commercial agriculture, right? So you're going to have much larger farms. Uh, this is not subsistence-based, right? This is an opportunity to uh, produce not just what you eat, but for export um, as well, right? In a subsistence village, the primary purpose is to protect your livestock, right? protect your farms, and protect your storage. Uh, in Western culture, right, and this may be true in some other areas of Europe as well, right, we're producing this for export. So protecting isn't uh, as big of an issue uh, as you'll see in more subsistence ones. And if part of this crop were to fail, you might make a little less money but you're not going to be subjecting your, your village to some, you know, famine or starvation. All right. See you next one.